Hello, my beloved uh, crystals. I thought I would give you um, a bit of live action with lip sync this time instead of overdubbing. I'm in Crystal Palace Park and it's a Sunday morning and I thought I'd be undisturbed here but this is like a, a jogger's super freeway and um, am I in the picture there? Yeah, I'm in the picture there. Um, the people walking their dogs and jogging as if they're on the M4 and uh, this is where I stay in London. I stay in this um, hostel, which is called... Um, it's part of the National Sports Centre, which is a brutalist, uh, rather elegant, brutalist concrete building. And you've got sort of strange brutalist, um, sort of Richard Serra-type sculptures here, jutting out over ponds and uh, ancient trees. And uh, what I like about this as a place to stay in London, apart from the cheapness, the fact that it's only um, £30 a night, to stay in this hostel, which is a 70s tower block in the middle of Crystal Palace Park um, with um, cladding, wooden cladding on the outside of the skyscraper. So in the wake of the, um, the big fire that happened in London a couple of months ago, it's, uh, probably people don't want to stay there because it looks like it would catch fire and uh, be very dangerous. I'm only halfway up the tower, so I could probably make it out, actually, in the event of a fire. But... Um, this is where I like to stay in London because I like uh, places which are unlikely and uh, contradictory. And, and the, You're in London and you're in this kind of smelly, polluted, um, stressful environment. But then you take the overground and you can come here to Crystal Palace and then walk into this park where the loudest sound is birds and jet planes heading to Heathrow. You're right under the flight path here. But there is a kind of Middle Earth element. You can probably pick that up even this, in this video. Um, Middle Earth airport atmosphere, anyway. So, uh, why am I in London? I mean, I said in my last video I was going to Brussels, and I obviously haven't gone to Brussels. That's because I was booked on Ryanair to fly to Brussels. And Ryanair, as you probably know, is having a pilot's dispute um, and all sorts of cancellations and delays on that airline. So I, um, it was only a 20-quid seat or something from Edinburgh to Brussels, and I, I had a hotel book, but I cancelled my hotel. I can't, didn't turn up for my flight. took the train instead to London because I knew the Freeze Art Fair was going on, and that in London it's kind of the art season. And uh, not just Freeze, but other satellite fairs like the Peckham International Art Fair, and the um, Sunday Art Fair, which is kind of satellite. There used to be a thing called the Zoo Art Fair in London Zoo, but that no longer happens. So um, I'll tell you about my adventures. So I got to London, and um, the first day I went to Peckham, uh, which is nice and close to Crystal Palace. Well, it's actually a bit tricky on the trains. You do spend a lot of your life on trains in London. That's the, the big drawback. But there are lots of things to do. So I, I, I'd never really been to Peckham Rye. I mean, I used to babysit in Peckham in the 80s, but it's um, improved a great deal since then. They built a really nice new library in Peckham. So I went to this, this place, um, which is a sort of um, a big artist studio area, uh, a gallery called um, um, Copeland Gallery, was hosting the so-called Peckham International Art Fair, but actually it wasn't much cop, to be honest. There was pretty much nobody there. And... Um, very little interesting art. There was a nice portrait which I put on my Tumblr of um, somebody whose face was totally obscured by their uh, iPhone. But um, basically, not much to see, but it was exciting to see Peckham itself. Peckham's a very vibrant um, multi-ethnic area and uh, fantastic African fabric shops and wig shops and um, uh, shopping arcades and, and uh, just a general sense of vibrancy when the sun is shining, really fantastic and I could understand why Peckham has become London's area of choice for ambitious young arty folk, um, art students and the like. There is a, a thriving Peckham scene around galleries like um, Auto Italia 
um, which I hadn't really investigated very much. I used to go to the, the Peckham, the South London Gallery in Peckham in the 80s, well, the 90s, I guess. Gosh, there's lots of sort of weird autumnal fruits like conkers and chestnuts and horsetails or whatever they're called lying about here. Yeah, so I enjoyed Peckham as Peckham. Um, I, I, I went there attracted by the hipster sort of scene and the art, but, but actually the art was um, less exciting than the ambience, than the environment. And that's quite a common experience for me. Uh, the street upstages the, the gallery space. Um, the next day, I tried to blag my way into the freeze out fair and failed. Um, and uh, because apparently the, the Freeze company has split into the, the magazine and the art fairs have kind of separated. So I went into the press office saying, hey, do you know where I am? And uh, do you know who I am? Because I'm a writer for, you know, Freeze occasionally. And, and they didn't know who the hell I was. And uh, they did ascertain from looking at Freeze.com that I wrote for Freeze magazine. But um, they said, uh, that's kind of not enough. You know, you have to be, um, you have to do... You have to be actually commissioned to review the, sh the art fair to, to get in on an art pass. So I, I stewed and fumed a little bit for, for most of Friday, thinking, you know, it's never been a problem in the past. I've always got into this art fair free, so I don't see why I shouldn't this year. And um, I went to the Sunday art fair to, to calm down. And that used to be, seems to me it used to be a bit more vibrant. See, my... I had a certain class ressentiment against Freeze for being the the art fair for rich, you know, bastards, basically, wealthy people, being part of the problem of cities like London, which is gentrification and um, well, just enormous one percentification of, of London being a playground for the extremely rich. Um, so I thought in my romantic way, my indie, underground-y way, the satellite art fairs will be where it's happening, where the real energy is, where the young artists are, the young galleries, the exciting galleries. That turned out not to be the case. Um, actually, there was a slightly sad and neglected atmosphere at the Sunday art fair. Maybe on Sunday, today, it's more exciting because it's Sunday. Uh, but really, um, all the action was in freeze. So uh, <laughs> by, by emailing the editor of Freeze, Dan Fox, and saying... How come I couldn't get into a freeze art fair? Um, I managed to pull a magic string and get a free pass to freeze. Not just the freeze contemporary art fair, but freeze masters, where a lot of a lot of sort of in the know people say, "Oh, that's a much better fair now." For but actually, it's just it's blue chip. You know, it's old dead artists basically in freeze masters, and they had, for instance, a little expressionism gallery in there where everything you know they had tiny little egg on Schiller for like two and a half million pounds with the price tag on it that's what freeze art for uh, freeze masters particularly is about blue chip art has investment you know money you know you get a special lounge for the deutsche bank um, wealth management fund or something you know and bmw ferries you to mayfair notably only to mayfair you get a special free bmw ferry bus, car, limo, whatever. It is very much for the super rich, and I, I resent that logic very much, but um, I had to admit that the, the art does follow the money, and that the most exciting ambience and the most exciting art was all in freeze, and you had to, I mean, if I'd been buying a ticket, it would have been like 50 quid or something to get in. Luckily, I could blag in, and this is really how I lived in London when I lived in London. I blagged my way into everything. You got free haircuts at Vidal Sassoon, you got free parties and drink and you know I was dating music journalists mostly and um, that was the way to, to get free everything and it was uh, you could dine banquet royally off the crumbs falling from the table of London's wealthy still the case if you're not journalist uh, maybe even more so today but um, what what impressed me I don't know I always get a certain buzz when I go to freeze to the contemporary art fair especially I, I see people I know um, not that many this year. I mean, Jeffrey Rosen from Misako and Rosen Gallery in Tokyo. Misako was back in Tokyo looking after their new child, their little girl. Um, uh, people um, sometimes recognize me and come up and say hello. So um, a guy called uh, Abe Oak, who's a, an ambient musician, actually very nice music if you find his um, page on SoundCloud, came up and said hello and was, was super friendly and um, so we hang out at Freeze Masters for a while 
and who should uh, amble up but the enormously tall, uh, Wildean figure of uh, Jarvis Cocker. I went up to him and said, Hi, Jarvis, you look like Oscar Wilde. I hadn't seen him for years. I used to bump into him everywhere when I lived in London. And, of course, 24 years ago, we filmed a, a documentary called Man of Letters together in Regent's Park, not a stone's throw from where I met him, actually, because the Freeze Master's tent is pretty close to London Zoo in Regent's Park. So um, it was nice to catch up with him, and I actually chatted with him quite a bit. He's very Eeyore-ish, Jarvis. He... Um, he, he essentially, you know, I was, I was saying, you know, I often quote you when people ask me, aren't you sad you never got famous? I sort of quote you saying, um, it's not much cob, it's a bit rubbish actually being famous. There's really not very much to recommend it. Uh, and yet he, he does admit that he works, he, he worked very hard all his life to get famous and then found out it was a bit rubbish. Um, although he was saying, oh, there must be some advantages to it. But he's very, he's very British in that way. That he sort of emphasizes the negative. So he was, he was saying, he, you know, I was saying, well, at least you've got to be an editor with Faber and Faber. And he's saying, oh, no, don't do that anymore. I kind of fell out with them. And, um, um, but he, did, he played a show last night. He made a, a solo album with um, Gonzalez um, earlier in the year, which I heard a little bit of. Um, I don't know. Basically, we were talking about just how great it is to be alive. At our age, you know, <laughs> help the aged. It's, um, it's just an enormous privilege to be alive, especially when people like David Bowie are, uh, are not, you know. You can have an exemplary life like Bowie and then not be around very long. Um, so I think the main thing is just to think how great it is to be alive. But I must say these art fairs and things do enhance that for me. They, they give it a little edge of um, delight. A little cocaine line of delight. Um, I suppose for me, just because it's I'm amongst people who love colour and who love form and texture, and people do take care to dress in a dandified way. It's the only time you see British people, and probably most of them, 80% of people at that fair are probably not British people, really. Um, but you do see people trying hard to make a good impression. And I, I saw a couple of interestingly dressed people, a couple of people who are trying too hard as well. Um, London, London has, I don't know, it's very easy, it's very tempting when you're not in London and you've lived here. I lived here longer than any other place I've lived uh, in my life. I lived here for 13 years in total and kept leaving and now I just visit. And it is a good city to visit. Um, I went by mistake because uh, there are some other um, art, f art fair related things at uh, Truman's Old Brewery at Brick Lane and I fed old Truman's old brewery into Google Maps and it um, it told me this place out, out at Hackney Wick so I was just blindly following the train instructions to get to Hackney Wick station thinking that's a bit funny I didn't know you could walk from there to uh, to Brick Lane you can't I mean well you could but it would take you all day um, but it was very interesting just seeing the the enormous amount of building that's going on around Hackney Wick station um, there's an area oh, there's a little dog chasing squirrels up a tree. Um, huge amount... <laughs> yeah, it's sort of running around my, my tree now. Huge amount of construction and, and, and really, um, God, yeah, just sort of um, mindless um, yuppie apartments going up and cranes everywhere and a lot of very resentful graffiti, anti-gentrification graffiti saying, you know, poor people, please exit uh, peacefully. And... Uh, Actually, one um, poster saying it's not just about your selfie, which kind of hit home. Um, so, yeah, that was quite interesting going there. I really enjoy um, East London, but my East London is no longer even East London. I mean, I think of East London as Brick Lane and Whitechapel, but actually now East London is kind of way out at Stratford and Hackney Marshes and stuff like that. And um, the city constantly shifts east and south. I mean, that's why I'm staying <laughs> so far south. It takes me ages to get down here. What I like about the um, the high-rise uh, hostel that I stay in here is, um, I guess it reminds me of institutional living in Britain in the 1970s. When I was at boarding school, now why would I want to be reminded of that, which I'm uh, on record as saying is the most miserable period of my life? Um, I suppose... I suppose it also reminds me of university. It reminds me, because the, the rooms are essentially like student halls of residence rooms. You get a little desk, a little bed, some um, fluorescent lights, strip lights, um, 
a sort of angle poised lamp, a kettle, a basin. Um, there's a toilet which is more or less en suite and a shower. So you have a little machine for a living. And I get this weirdly perverse pleasure from reducing my needs in that Bauhaus sense of what is the minimal machine for a living someone needs, how little space can someone survive in. Um, a room of one's own, as Virginia Woolf put it, is really all you need. Um, and uh, which reminds me, I met, I ran into some other people at Freeze that I knew, Brian Dillon, whose new book Essayism is ubiquitous at the moment. You see that everywhere on, I think, Galapagos Publishing. And um, he's, uh, yeah, he was quoting Virginia Woolf on his Twitter feed recently. Virginia saying, nobody who hasn't been seriously ill can really write good literature. So I was recommending Voice Through a Cloud by Denton Welsh, which he hasn't read, actually, um, as the ultimate bit of sick lit. Um, really fantastically, beautifully written a description of fevers and illness and hospital treatment and stuff like that. And a slow lingering death, in fact, in Denton Welsh's case. Here I am in Middle Earth, um, talking about death. Yeah, this... this um, I find this tower block... Uh, hostel fantastically atmospheric I seem to be the only person staying there just now I think they, they tend to get large um, coach parties of athletes sometimes school children actually are staying there and they're all doing exercise in the sports centre next door the Brutalist National Sports Centre but um, when, they're, when the coach parties are not there like now you have this whole huge tower in the middle of a woodlands to yourself and and you have fresh air and you have these animal cries foxes terriers um all the rest of it so i do have some sad associations not just with boarding school um i don't know it's weird uh, I, boarding school for instance i used to hide if i wanted to be alone you can't really be alone when you're at boarding school you're, you're every minute is regimented but i would sneak away to either the music rooms the senior common room could get a certain amount of um, solitude, but I would go to the drying rooms down in the basement where it was extremely hot, tropically hot, but also it had a kind of urine smell because people had wet the bed. They'd have to um, clean and dry out the mattresses and things down there. So I would just lurk down there and sometimes matron would burst in and think I was you know, up to something naughty. When in fact I was usually just reading my Penguin Modern Classics. So here I am in this place that does have a laundry room in the basement, a very atmospheric one, um, where you can wash your clothes and dry them and stuff, and it's just fantastic 70s tech of uh, boilers and pipes and things. Again, that jungle-like atmosphere. So I go down there with my Penguin Modern Classic, because I, I go to bookshops and buy these modern classics now. Again, probably to rekindle some sense of what books meant to me when I was 12 years old, you know. And they were the only culture, you know, pre-internet, the only cultural kind of uh, conduits you could have to a, a better world, a more sensitive world, a more interesting world, a more artistic world. So I had these um, grace-bind Penguin Modern Classics by, you know, Alan Payton or, um, um, you know, it would be um, Brave New World and things like that as well, the Aldous Huxley. So I often, I sit in this, this brutalist 70s hostel kind of reliving my youth and, um, and enjoying the absolute minimum of uh, the the existence minimum, I think the Bauhaus called it the absolute minimum. There have also been some good exhibitions on in London. Uh, I always go to the Welcome Museum on Euston Road, and that has a really great um, exhibition about the graphic design of medical products, um, pills, and things like that, which is um, well worth a visit and is free as well. The other exhibitions in London, they're, they're very, very expensive. Like the Barbican Gallery has Jean-Michel Basquiat exhibition, but it's like 14 quid or something to get in there. Um, there's a Thomas Roof exhibition at the uh, Whitechapel Gallery, but again, it's 12 quid, you know, or to get in. Um, I really just am not inclined to stump up that amount of money. Even getting into freeze-free, um, by the time I had lunch and a couple of coffees and, and an ice cream, you know, I was probably 30 quid down, so... Um, London is very expensive, and I, I couldn't live here now. Um, cheapness is freedom. That's my motto. And uh, London is not cheap, so London is not free. 
Sorry, Jarvis Cocker and, you know, all you people who live... Actually, Jarvis divides his time. He was telling me he still has a place in Paris and he divides his time between Paris and London. I've always thought that quote, that Dr. Johnson quote, that the man who's tired of London is tired of life. I've always thought that was complete rubbish. Um, the world is very big. Everything, just as London's axis has moved more to the east, so has the world's. Asia is now where it's at. Tip. See you next time. Open University. Thank you.